Well, like you said, I'm Josh. I'm glad to be here. Thank you guys for letting me come talk about testing. You can ask my coworkers. I talk about testing way too much sometimes. I get another outlet here. That's that's wonderful. Um, I love the Ruby Meetup. Um, I first came to my first one about six or eight months ago, and that's actually where I got my current job. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, I've been in software development for about years, um, but was looking to get into Ruby and Rails. And uh, so um, I'm working at Big Nerd Ranch now, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, the Ruby community is just an awesome community to be, to be a part of. So I love getting down here as often as I can, and so hope to get to know you guys uh, better through being here. So um, I am coding it wrong on Twitter. Um, you can judge for yourself after this presentation how accurate that is. I'm definitely coding it wrong on GitHub, uh, that's for sure. Um, and again, I, I work at Big Nerd Ranch, so here's where you can get in touch with us on Twitter or the website. Um, we're based in Atlanta. We do a custom web app and mobile app development. Um, we also do training and uh, write books, uh, Big Nerd Guides, on a bunch of different technologies. Um, we actually have a Ruby on Rails course coming up on June 27th. And uh, I haven't been to the course myself, but I've been through the material, the book we go through, and it's awesome. Um, it's how I got up to speed on Rails um, six months ago when I got started. Really good. The instructor, Jay, is awesome. Um, it's down in Callaway Gardens, and so it's a bit of a retreat that you get to go on. Um, the experience is a big part of it. So it's not just information. It's kind of getting out there, getting away from it all with other folks that are excited about learning. And so so um, it's highly recommended. Um, there's a little bit.ly link I made. You can go to check it out, read more about it, and uh, definitely ask me if uh, you have any questions. Um, I have some big nerd swag over there, including some uh, uh, cowboy boot koozies for beer or for soft drinks, and some other uh, nerd glasses. So I'm going to put those out of the table there, grab some of those on the way out. Um, so yeah. So um, like I said, I'm new to Rails and Ruby in the last uh, le less than a year. Um, before that, um, I was really excited about testing. Um, how many of you guys have read uh, Michael Hartle's Rails tutorial book? Anyone? That's a whole bunch, yeah. I was wondering if it was still as big as it used to be. Um, so that's how I got into it, and I loved the testing focus. The fact that he could teach all this stuff and teach testing at the same time. And the fact that just in the Rails stack, that testing is something that is kind of built in, that it's there for you and ready to go. Um, I was working on a different technology. I won't say which one uh, for the sake of heckling of it, because I heckle it plenty myself. Uh, but uh, testing was a really hard thing for us to do. Um, so the big question for us was, how do we get started in testing? Um, and the thing was, you know, we were excited about it, we liked the idea, um, but we had all kinds of questions. And so see if any of these ring a bell for you guys with your uh, testing experience. So do I write the test first or the production code first? What do I test first? How many acceptance tests or unit tests do I write? How much test code do I write at a time? How much production code? Do I test every line of code and configuration? And how much do I use test doubles like mox, mox and stubs? What do I test for when I'm doing it? So that was a lot to take in and a lot to try to figure out. Thankfully though, on the internet, everyone agrees. So we're good to go, right? <laughs> So obviously not. Um, if you've read about testing at all, see if any of this rings a bell. Unit tests are good. Unit tests are bad. Mocks are good. Mocks are bad. So we, uh, that's pretty much what we felt like at the end of all that, trying to figure it out. Um, and so we just decided, all right, there's all these questions. We kind of have to know what to do before we get started. So we're just going to make all the decisions. And uh, so trying to learn everything about testing and become an ex expert before we even got started, uh, it's, uh, you can guess how well that worked. Um, and it was, a lot, it was really tough. And so. Um, the question we sort of ask, and the question I've kind of come to is, what if we didn't have to worry about all those questions at once? Um, what if there was a way to get started in testing um, and get your feet wet in it to get a feel for it, and then you could use that info to kind of bootstrap your way into having a bit more knowledge and insight to figure out some of the more advanced questions? Um, and that's what the role I think the test-driven development can play, among some of the other benefits of this approach, is that it's an approach to testing that provides a consistent set of answers to those questions. You don't have to worry about if your approach to mocking totally contradicts your approach to acceptance tests or things like that. You've you got a, a set of answers that's consistent, that works together, and, and it'll work all right, at least. And now, you may in the end say, I don't like test-driven development, I want to take a totally different approach, and you can hand-tailor your testing approach from that point. Um, but I think having a scheme like test-driven development to start with um, really helps. And uh, so I'm going to spend the t presentation talking about what test driven development is. Um, the way it struck me the other day is um, I have read enough about testing now that I would say that yes, there are no easy answers. There's, there's no things where it's like it's obvious this is just the way you should always test. Um, but I think there is a possible reasonable starting point. Like I don't think it needs to be that hard. I think it should be approachable. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about. So a quick thing that I couldn't really start a talk on testing uh, without mentioning is the whole idea of if TDD is dead. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, an infamous statement by uh, someone who was well known a few years ago about that. And uh, 
uh, I've listened to some of the um, the podcasts, the discussions that came out of this thing, and it's really helpful stuff. Um, I'm going to share some links at the end of the presentation for more stuff to read on testing, and, and uh, I'd highly recommend checking any of that out. Um, there's a lot of great criticisms in that uh, conversation about some of the problems you can get into in testing. Um, but so I would say that in addition to just the acceptance testing you might do just to make sure that your app works, um, I think there are still benefits of unit testing and of the test-driven approach. So as we go through the presentation, I'm going to show some of that. And again, this is not to say that you, ha that you have to do test-driven development, but uh, just that it can be helpful. Um, and I guess that's what I'm going to talk about next. So another concern you might have is, wow, TDD, like the people I've heard about it are kind of Nazis. They like, kind of make people feel bad about themselves and their testing. Um, and so is TDD something that's inherently too rigid? Um, and so I think proponents of it can certainly be that way. And so I just want to apologize for that. If you've been turned off to testing or TDD because someone was a jerk to you about it, like that really sucks. And so I hope that hasn't happened. So for me, what I'm trying to get across is not that you have to follow this exactly or you're a bad developer. And not that this is the only way it can be done. Uh, I'm going to say, anybody here who's from Bigner Ranch will see some of I'm doing that's like, well, I wouldn't actually do it that way. Um, what I recommend is that this is something I'd recommend for all of us, whether you've never done any testing before, whether you've tried TDD and rejected it, I'd recommend giving it a wholehearted try. Uh, then you'll know when to apply it and when not to. You can make your own decision about yourself and your wiring and the system and team you're on where it fits. But it's only by giving it a wholehearted try at first that you can kind of get that sense and make that call. Um, but if you don't want to do that, maybe just take a principle or two. Maybe there's something about mocks in here that's helpful um, or some full, something about going outside in that would help you out. So my goals in talking is I want to show TDD applied to a small real world example, trivial really, really small example. I want to show how it answers that list of questions from before um, about how to get started in testing. I want to motivate you to try it if you haven't or if you haven't done it strictly. Um, but a couple things that aren't my goals are, uh, my goal is not to convince you that testing is a good idea. Um, there's lots of people that talk about that, and it's great, and I love to talk about that too, so you can grab me or hit me up on Twitter or Tech404, um, but that's not what I'm getting into today. Not so much to introduce testing concepts and terms. I'm going to define stuff as I go to make sure you can follow a little bit. But if you haven't heard of acceptance tests or of mocks or stubs before, then a you may want to do a little more research and then just check this out afterwards on YouTube to help get you back up to speed. Um, and not to provide rationale for individual points of TDD. Like, I'm not arguing for each of them. I'm kind of presenting the whole walkthrough of start to end to see at a big picture level how it fits together. So that's kind of the focus. Um, one last thing of intro. Um, I have kind of a hobby project as I found out more and more that TDD is wired for and that I love doing. Um, so if you're coming out of this talk and you say, hey, you know, I, this is great. Like, I'd really love to learn TDD in Rails. Then if you want to do that, you can go to learn TDD in Rails, and then you can do that. Um, so I've got a post on there that actually walks through the same content we're talking about here. I've got a GitHub re repo that steps through this. It's actually the repo that I took the snapshots on here out of. And so you can follow along there. And on that side, I'm, I'm excited about this. So I'm adding, I've got an Ember uh, tutorial for TDD that is just going up. I barely know Ember. So Patrick back there is going to need to correct me on things I need to improve. I'm looking to add hopefully a few other frameworks on there as well. So if you're interested in learning TDD, check it out and let me know how I can improve. It's all open source so you can help make corrections and improvements. So let's get into the testing. So uh, we have a requirement for a feature we want to write. And uh, you can probably guess that's the feature. We want to make a blog post, of course. That's what we always want to do. So probably should have made a Twitter service, but I'm stuck 10 years ago. So that's OK. I'm fine with that. So let's jump in. So I want to talk about this in terms of the questions that TDD answers. So for the first question is, I've got to write some code. Should I write the test or production code first? And as you might imagine, like the whole point of the name of TDD is that you write your tests first. You write the test, and then that drives your development. Um, this one I want to talk about for just a second. Why, why write the test first? Um, so there are a few reasons. Um, one of them, make sure there's time to test. I've been on lots of projects where we put off testing until the end. And then, hey, last minute feature changes. Imagine that. To make sure your code is covered by tests, to make sure you've covered all the possibilities, um, to make sure your code is easy to test, that's, that's a tough one if you've got a whole existing system and try to wrap tests around it somehow. And then finally, to let tests drive your design or influence your design. There's this idea that by writing these tests, you're going to see what it's like to use your code in other contexts, and that's going to guide you in a good direction. I had an experience working with a coworker just today where, um, without even knowing it, the test just led us in this great direction to this design that was better than I could have come up with on my own. So that's some of the reasons, again, something I love to talk about, and there's lots of links I could send you on. So OK, so i got to write the test first. What do I test first? Well, uh, first we're going to start outside the system. This is the particular approach to TDD that I like to take. Um, so we're going to write a test that simulates a user interacting with the system. Um, and then from there, that's going to guide us to whatever classes and objects we need. 
So how much tests do I write at a time? Um, well, at, at the outside level, at the acceptance test level, the simulating user, I'd write a whole acceptance test for one feature. Um, so in this case, the creating a blog post, we're going to write it all from start to end. Um, so this is going to be a lot of code up here, and we're putting it up. Again, that's why you don't, don't, certainly don't copy down all the code. It's in the GitHub repo. Um, so here's the acceptance test. We've got it here. Um, I'm using RSpec. Uh, you know, most of you guys, I assume that's pretty familiar to you, but it's pretty readable syntax, if not. Um, so in order to test here that we want to save and display the resulting blog post, um, we're going to visit the blog post new page, fill in a title and body field, click create. And then uh, first we're going to check uh, in the database to make sure it got saved. And then we're also going to check on the resulting page to make sure the title and the body come up there. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, so the next question that comes up, this actually illustrates the answer to another question that TDD provides, is uh, how much do I use test doubles? So mocks and stubs, people argue, like should you use them, should you not use them? Well, so TDD, uh, in my understanding of it, would guide you to say an acceptance test, don't use test doubles. Uh, another word or related concept for acceptance test is end-to-end -end testing. And in this standpoint, you want to be as much like the real user going into the system as possible, even to the point of making real HTTP requests if you can, um, and actually going back and hitting a real database on the end. So you don't want to fake any of that out if you can help it. And it will be a bit slower, um, but it's going to make sure you're testing the real system, the full system, and not just a simulation of individual bits that uh, don't fit together. So we've got this test and we're ready to go to test all the stuff that we don't have the first bit of code on. And so now we're going to start it and watch it fail. And that was totally a non-intuitive thing if, when you first get started in test-driven development. But this is a very common thing. You want to run the test and watch it fail to know what to implement first. Now I'm sure most of you in the room could say, well, I'm going to make a thing to create a blog post. I can imagine exactly what I'm going to do to do that. Um, but by letting the test bring you there, um, it puts it in a certain order and it drives it to make sure the tests cover it and a lot of different benefits. And it can be really great for focus. Um, okay, so first we're going to run that test. And I'm just kind of showing the output of the command line command up there and then the failure. Um, so creating a blog post, um, the error we get is no route matches blog post slash new. Um, so what we're going to do in response to this is, uh, well, first we're going to create uh, the blog post wrap, and uh, then that's it. That's all we're going to do for right now. And so that, again, seems pretty unintuitive. Like, well, why would I create a, a route without a controller that goes to it? But um, the approach is to uh, really just write enough tests just to get past the current error. Um, because if you go beyond that, you're making assumptions about what you want and how you want to go instead of letting the tests guide you there. Um, and uh, it takes a long time to talk about, but when you're doing it, I mean, this would be a few seconds of running the test, seeing the error, adding the route, running the test again. And so the turnaround time really is pretty quick. So, uh, another question is, do I test every line? Um, Rails does have a facility to write a test for a route. And so do I write a test for the route? Um, well, you can, um, but my recommendation would be, uh, no, you can fix trivial errors directly, um, like missing route. We're going to see another few trivial things that I feel like it's OK um, to write. Just go ahead and implement it instead of writing a smaller unit level test for. Um, so other people would agree, uh, disagree. Uh, other people would agree, hopefully. We'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, so you don't need to test every single line. Um, all right, so again, I answered this already. How much production code do I write at a time? Just enough to fix the current error. So that's all we want to do for now. Um, so this relates to a common phrase talking about test-driven development, which is red-green refactor. Um, and so what this means is first you write the test and run it to get red to confirm that it's failing. And uh, one interesting note about that is by, by doing that first and getting red first, you're kind of testing the test. You're making sure that the test really fails because if the test passes before you implemented the feature, the test is wrong or you're not, you already have the feature. Surprise, like congratulations. Um, so you run the test first to make sure that it fails and then you go green. So you write the code that gets that test to pass and then you refactor, which is, okay, you've got it passing now. You can safely make changes to the code and confirm if you've broken anything. So now you look at your code and you say, is there anything I can do to improve it, remove duplication, make things clearer or run better? Um, one quick note on refactoring. The uh, example I'm showing is so trivial, I could barely think of anything to refactor. And so do not follow that pattern. Uh, like, refactoring is really important. And uh, one of, that's one of the biggest things I've learned at Big Nerd, actually, is just the value that comes from being really focused on your code and the readability and the maintainability of it. Um, the payoff over the long run of a project is amazing to get out of a situation where you've got this terrible code that you're afraid to work on. I can think of something. What? Yeah. Bloggers for posts sucks. That's a URL. Yeah. I think I did that because there's so many references to post like the uh, uh, HTTP request that I want a little difference. I should have a hyphen? Like yeah. Well, see, it was Rails. The whole underscore thing just ran, 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 led me in that direction. So, cool. I'm sure there will be other uh, refactorings along the way for sure. 
so yeah, so we got the test, um, and you know we've got it. Uh, we fixed that error, so now we want to run it again and see the next error that comes up. And so now the next error is, as I predicted a minute ago, we don't have a blog post controller. We've got the route, but no controller back ended up. So let's go ahead and implement that. Again, that's just to have the class is pretty trivial. Let's go ahead and build it. Um, so I dropped it on here. I actually did this without even thinking about it. Um, but then after the fact, I thought about, well, wait a second. I don't really have to subclass application controller to get the test to pass. And all we need is just a, a blog post controller constant. So I was like, should I go back and change it? But then I was like, you know, that feels like something that's small enough. It's like, how many controllers are you going to have in your app that don't subclass some kind of parent controller? And so I was like, I felt like this is safe enough. Um, maybe I'm a bad example of sticking to the rules. But you know, maybe you'll be less frustrated with it if you feel like stuff like this you can go ahead and do. So I felt comfortable going ahead and subclassing application controller. I felt like it was OK. So we run, we run the test. Now the action new could not be found for blog post controller. Well, that's pretty simple. Add it in. We're good to go. Rerun the test. Now missing template. So of course, even though we haven't written any code, Rails, the default behavior is to render a template for that page. And we do want to do that. So I'm going to drop the template in. I'm just going to keep the file empty, other than I added a comment up there just so you'd know there, that there even was a file at all. Um, but, and that's where it would be, of course. Um, but yeah, let's just the, the test just says there's no template. So let's just add an empty template and see what the next error that it sends us to is. Next, it says unable to find field title. OK, so uh, you know, uh, RSpec has gotten to the point in the acceptance test where it's actually able to hit that route and render it. It hasn't blown up yet. And it goes on to the next step where it says fill in the title field. And now it says the field is not there. So we want to go ahead and add that form. And this is another case where I feel like you can go ahead and add um, more than is necessary. Uh, to make the test pass. So how much production code do I write at a time? Previously, I said just enough to get the test pass. And I'd say, well, sometimes more than enough to fix the current error. In this case, like, you know, I could just add the title field, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a body field. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a submit button. And the other thing is, um, you're never going to write acceptance tests to the level of detail that it drives out all the markup you're going to need. I mean, you're going to write an acceptance test that says, you know, the, all these form elements for bootstrap are there and all the divs and the classes. It's like, if you do that, then show me if you can make that work, because I can't make that work. So that's something that you're going to write by hand anyway. So again, I feel like going ahead and dropping the whole form on there seems reasonable, seems safe. Um, so we run the test again. The title field is there as well as those other, as well as those other fields. Um, so next we get the error that says, first argument in form cannot contain nil or be empty. Um, well, it's actually form four, not form that shows up in there. But it, you know, dig into it a little bit, or maybe you're experienced enough with Rails that's obvious. So that blog post variable that we're passing in there is empty because there is absolutely nothing that happens in our controller action. So can't render a form for, for a model that isn't there. Um, at this point, we come into the question of when do I write unit tests? Uh, unit tests using the kind of general form, because to get real strict isolated unit tests in Rails can be a challenge. But I just mean, as opposed to acceptance tests that test your whole feature end to end, a lower level test that tests an individual class. Um, and I would say step down to a unit test when there are behavioral errors. Um, another thing I read said logic errors. And what I mean by that is, uh, as opposed to just like code structure errors. So everything we've run across up until this point is there's no route. There's no controller class. There's no action. There's no template. Um, or there's nothing on the template. Um, those are all just very simple structural things um, that don't really have a lot of behavior um, or logic to them. But at this point, um, it's still pretty small. But we're talking about the behavior of the, the new controller action. And so at that point, it's like, OK, like we can step down a level to write a unit test, to write a controller test to drive this out. Um, this example is a little bit forced, because most people I talk to don't generally recommend writing separate controller tests. But for the sake of demonstrating the simplest possible Rails application, we're mainly talking about the principle of stepping down a level. And if that is super bu bugs you that I'm showing you something that I wouldn't do, then talk afterwards. And I can give you some uh, examples of places that we step down into lower levels. Um, it mainly relates to other classes. Um, but this is going to demonstrate that, that the idea of stepping down to a lower level class. So, I felt like this was another why question that I couldn't really zoom past. Why unit test when there's already an acceptance test? You know, the acceptance test is covering the behavior. Um, in this approach, like, you know that the acceptance test is covering the behavior. It's not like the acceptance test is just the happy path. Um, it's, it's, it's covering everything out. So why do you do it? Um, and this, when this clicked for me, this was super helpful. It's given me a lot of clarity. So acceptance tests have a lot of value. They demonstrate the external quality of your system, which is to say for a user using it, um, does the system work? Like, Does it work end to end? Do all the pieces fit together and does the behavior happen and get saved and everything like that. 
But something that acceptance tests don't do is demonstrate the internal quality of your system, whether the code is maintainable, how well written is it, how well modular is it, does it follow good OO practices. Um, not overkill OO practices, but just OO practices that keep you from having a thousand line long user class or you know controller classes with dozens of methods. Um, so acceptance tests don't get into that because it's a black box. It's just using your system for the outside. And you could literally refactor everything to make it perfect uh, or make it a total mess. And the acceptance test will still pass. So it can't help you with that. That's what unit tests do. They expose the internal quality of the system. They drive design. Um, just today, um, I was working on a test for like a class that generated a search query. And uh, as me and my coworker were working on it, um, you know, using it from the controller um, going into the search query class worked great. It was fine. But as we started unit testing it, we were like, wow, there's some inconsistency here and there's some duplication. And it ended up leading us to a much simpler design that was very cool, much more extensible. Um, and so just today, it struck me just how fun it is to let unit tests guide you. Um, so let's jump down into one and see how it works. Um, so at this point, um, again, if you're not familiar as much with the idea of this lower level test or unit test, we want to test the controller directly um, and kind of assert the behavior that's happening on there. Um, that relates to the next question, how much test do I write? Well, at the unit test level, you want to only write enough unit tests to expose the behavioral error, the one that came in from the acceptance test. So we wrote that whole long acceptance test, and we're stepping through that one piece at a time as it errors out. But when the acceptance test said the blog post is missing, then at the unit test level, let's say, OK, let's just create a test to assert or to specify that the blog post will be uh, created and passed to the view there. And that's all we want to test for now. Um, and ha there's a lot of benefits to having unit tests kind of broken down to this level of granularity. But again, it's letting the acceptance test drive us to certain uh, unit tests that we need instead of assuming in advance everything we're going to need. Another way to say it is, how much test do I write? Well, specify one behavior per unit test case. We're not saying this is everything that, uh, blog that the new method does on blog post controller. We're just saying, well, here's one thing. And this is what I know I need to specify right now, so let's just do that. Um, so here's another question. How much do I use test doubles? Well, the answer is, again, just the opposite of for an acceptance test. In unit test, use test doubles in place of any collaborators. Um, so we want to be as isolated as possible. Again, with Rails, it can kind of be a challenge. Um, but I've learned um, some pragmatic ways to go about it so you're not working around the framework, and yet you're getting a lot of the benefits of the isolation. So in this case, instead of using the blog post class, uh, an instance of the blog post class directly, we're using the uh, RSpec mocks framework to say, give me an instance double of, of a blog post. Uh, give me something that acts like a blog post instance, but don't actually run anything against it. Let me just tell you what methods you can use and what the return value should be. Um, and then down in the line below that, we're not actually going to hit the blog post class directly. We're going to mock. Uh, we're going to mock out the new method on that and say, hey, when you try to call new on the blog post class, here's the uh, fake object to return as a result of that. So we're not actually hitting the database here. It uh, should be a lot, provide you a lot of speed benefits. And it lets us uh, get some insight into what's happening inside our class. Um, the acceptance test level, all we can do is look at the very boundaries of the system. Like, what are the requests coming in through HTTP, and what are the requests going out to the database? Or what is the state of the data in the database? Um, but at the unit test level, we can track what exact messages are being sent out to that class class and to that instance, um, well, not the instance in this case, but to the class. Um, so yeah, so this is why the confusion around testing of, well, do I use mocks and stubs or do I not? It's like, well, it depends on what type of test you're talking about. At acceptance le test level, in this approach, I'd recommend not using any kind of test doubles if you can help it. And at the unit test level, I'd recommend using as many as possible. Uh, then, uh, what do I test for? Well, in unit tests, uh, oftentimes, like it's great to test for behavior whenever possible. Like instead of going and checking uh, which blog post records got created, um, to actually use mocks, which is a, a mock is basically when you're saying this object should receive this message, and here's how it should behave. So we're testing behavior. We're testing does the new method on the blog post controller send out this message to the blog post class asking for a new instance? Um, that. You, behavior versus state is a very deep and heady thing. So if that doesn't make sense, then just uh, stick with using test doubles and go from there. Um, so we're ready to run this uh, unit test. When we run it, um, we get an error uninitialized constant blog post. And so even though we're actually uh, mocking out that blog post class, uh, RSpec mocks does require that class to be there. So I'm going to create it. And again, I'm not just going to create an empty class. I feel all right to. Um, to go ahead and uh, create it as an active record model, go ahead and create the migration to add the uh, um, to add the fields onto it. If you feel like I'm not being strict enough uh, and you want to be even more TDD than me, then awesome and help me learn from you and be encouraged by you. So that's great. But to make it easy, it's like yeah, we know we're going to need that. Let's go ahead and add it. 
So we run the migration, we've got the model now. Now we run the unit test again. And again, just to point out, um, here depend, there's lots of different ways to run tests. Here in the command line here, I'm showing just running against the one individual test file. That keeps things a lot faster. Um, in my IDE, uh, in my text editor that's not an IDE, because I'm not an IDE person, but it's great if you are, um, I've got a shortcut that will run just the test of the file I'm in, or just the individual example that I'm in. So that makes the workflow really fast. Um, all right, so now we run it. Uh, the blog post class is there. We're on to the next error, which says I expected uh, an ins the, uh, that instance double of the blog post, and I got nil. Um, so nothing, no blog post was set into the assigns, which is some Rails niceties to basically say, uh, did your controller assign an instance variable, which of course is the normal way that a controller passes data to a view. So we're just, we're just not setting that instance variable in the controller. So we're at the unit test now. So we've now re reproduced the error that was happening at the acceptance test level down at the unit test level. And the reason why is because we want to specify the behavior of this unit very precisely and implement it there. So we're letting the unit test help us to fix the error that was happening at the acceptance test level. So now that it's happened at the unit test level, we can implement it. We just drop that blog post attribute on there, uh, blogpost.new, rerun that unit test, and it's passing. And so we're good to go. So the next question that comes up is, how often do I run which tests? I've got two tests now. What do I run when? Well, I already said that when you're working at the unit level, you've got a failing test that you're using to guide you. Uh, go ahead and just rerun re that one. But when the unit test passes, step back up to the acceptance test, run it again, see if you're done, or see if you've moved on to the next error. And so really what you've got going on here in this model of testing is two red-green refactor loops. At the acceptance test level, you make it red by writing the failing test. Uh, and then you, to, in order, well, sometimes you just go ahead and fix that error at that level. But when you get a logic error, you step down to the unit test level, make it red, make it green, do refactoring, and then you jump back up to the acceptance test level to see if it's still red or if it's green or if you can refactor. So acceptance, a unit test. And you can break things down more than that, but those two general levels uh, really helps out a lot and works well. Um, so we jump back up to the acceptance, list, uh, the acceptance test. Again, just to show you because we haven't seen it for a while. This is the test again. Again, visit the page, fill it in, click create, and then check the database and the screen. Um, and the next error we get is uh, the, we actually have everything through the create button working, but now the action cre create could not be found for blog post controller. And uh, this is actually a great stopping point for us to get some food because from here on out, we've got most of the answers. It's just kind of practicing more, putting it into practice. So let's take a break there and get some food and get back together in a moment. Cool, well, let's jump back in. The second half will go quicker because we got all the principles. We're gonna go just as fast as you would on your machine. Maybe not quite that fast. They told me not to go that fast. So like we said, we got two red-green refactor loops. So we've uh, we built the acceptance test. We got some simple stuff failing that we fixed. We jumped down to the unit test level for the controller to implement that feature. And then we jumped back up to the acceptance test level. And now uh, we looked at it right before we stopped. But uh, let's look at it again. We've got our test to fill out the form, submit it, and check the database and the resulting screen. And now at the acceptance test level, we get a different error. The action create could not be found. So we are getting the form, we are filling it out, we're clicking create, and now that uh, submission has nowhere to go. So we're going to start out, again, just kind of do the trivial change to the blog post controller, add that create method, um, run again, Looks going to look very simple, uh, very similar, missing template, blog post create. Um, usually for a create action, of course, you'd redirect uh, to like the show page or somewhere else, a success page. Um, we're just, for the sake of this simple example, we're just going to um, go ahead and have the uh, create action render the view. So we're going to go ahead and create that template. Again, a mostly empty template there. Get past that error in the acceptance test. Now it says undefined method title for nil class. And uh, so that's up on uh, blog post title. So this is where it's actually checking in the database to see if there is, in fact, a blog post that got saved. And there's not. And that's because we haven't told it to save anything. Uh, we haven't told it anything about the create method, in fact. Um, so now uh, we, again, have it now a behavior of the controller action that we want to implement. So because it's a behavior and not just simple structural stuff, we want to jump down to the unit test level, back into that controller test, and specify this behavior there. So down here, we've got our create action. Uh, we say, OK, it creates a blog post record. Again, that, that's all we want to talk about right now. No rendering, no redirecting, nothing else uh, we want to specify yet. And so we say, OK, the create action creates a blog post record. Um, so again, we use uh, mocking up here to say um, blog post class uh, should receive a create method. Here's the parameters passed in, because we actually want to confirm that the right pa parameters are sent over there um, into that outgoing message. Um, and then we do the post. And uh, I didn't mention this before, but um, again, the, in Rails, the controller test is not really a full strict unit test. There's a little bit of Rails magic going on, as there usually is with Rails. Um, and so that post method, method there, or the get method in the previous uh, 
test um, just lets you go through Rails a little bit um, to get that request into the controller rather than calling the method directly. That sets up request objects and stuff like that. So for a controller test, that's generally what you want to do. But the, the key is we're accessing the op object more or less directly, not through the entire stack, just as, as little of the Rails stack as they'll let us. Um, so we do the post to the create method. We pass in that, the title and the body that we want to be saving in the standard Rails uh, form submission format. Um, and again, all, all we're doing here is it's, there's no other uh, assertions to make or expectations to set after that post. We really just want to confirm that that create method gets called on the blog post uh, there. So we run this unit test. Um, and now we get the error again, which is what we expect. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the screen there, but basically what it's saying is blogpost.create was expected once with the correct arguments, and it was received zero times because, of course, we're not calling it yet. So we've now re reproduced that logic error from the acceptance test level. We're ready to implement it. And so we go ahead and put in blogpost.create, pass in the parameters there, and uh, wait for it, because if you're a Rails developer, you probably know what is wrong there, but we're going to let the test drive us there. So. So the unit test passes. Disaster, it didn't catch the problem that you guys all caught. Um, but that's OK. And the reason why is because everything that's happening at the unit test level is all good. Um, so uh, this is why it's important to have acceptance tests. Because just because you have unit tests doesn't mean everything is not going to blow up. So, so we're good. Um, that behavior is happening. The call out to the model is happening properly. So we're good to go. So let's jump up to back to the acceptance test level and run it. Um, and now we get a good old forbidden attributes error. So Rails is protecting us. So you can't just pass the parameters into a model, Josh. What are you thinking? So you know, there's obviously strong parameters is a feature of Rails that's going to protect us and make sure that's safe to do. But it's at the acceptance test level that gets caught. So at the unit test level, we weren't sending in a request object from Rails. We were just sending in uh, a hash that we created right there. And so that's why that hash is acceptable just fine. There's no security problems there with a hard-coded hash. But actual parameters that come in from an actual test, like the acceptance test is doing, create an error. And so that's the slide. Go back to the other slide. So you are calling create. So a uh, validation would catch that. You would know with a validation error, which that test would catch. What kind of validation, specifically? Like if you did a you know, validate title. Mm -hmm. That's going to make it not save, which your test there would have failed. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, and the, obviously this is a super trivial example that doesn't even have validation. So there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, yeah. So, but this is again one of the reasons that it's so important to have these end-to-end -end tests um, because you're testing all the pieces going together to make sure that this won't happen. Um, I had an animated GIF that I forgot to put in here. It was so great. I think uh, Swift on Security, Frank and I's favorite Twitter account, tweeted it was about 99% uh, of unit tests pass, and uh, shows an umbrella that, uh, that pops out and opens, and then the top of the umbrella falls off of it. And uh, I was like, okay, you got to test end to end. Like the individual piece is working is not good enough. Um, it would have been so much better if I had the GIF. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll go into my personal site. I don't know. So it'll be good. So, the, so forbidden attributes error. So we need to now go back into our code and do this the correct way with strong parameters where we're saying, hey, title and body are the allowable parameters. You can let them through, uh, protect me from kind of security problems and from bad data being injected in there into my model. And so now the acceptance test does get past that error. And we're on to the next thing. So we're cruising. Um, next, the acceptance test said, uh, OK, I was looking in the page for the title, hello world, to be outputted. And the page is empty string. There is literally nothing being outputted to the page. OK, great. So um, now we can jump in to our template and put the template contents. And again, you know, we can put the title and the body at the same time. I feel like that's pragmatic. I don't feel like there's any downside to that. We run that acceptance test. And now it says undefined method title for nil. So if we look back up, it's blog post.title. So now we're not actually setting that blog post uh, to be available to the template to be able to render it. Um, and so now we want to go into the create, uh, into the blog post controller unit test, step back down, and define this behavior. The behavior that we want a blog post actually to be passed out of the controller, assigned in the controller action to be available for the template. Now this is interesting, and this is new to the second part here. Notice that I've created a separate example under create. So I have my first example, or test case, that says create creates a blog post record. And now I'm specifying it also returns the new blog, blog post to the view. And you'll see there's some duplication, like we're doing the post again and separating things out. Um, so it's really helpful at the unit test level to keep these examples as granular as possible. This is something that I've really been learning a lot. Um, it makes your um, results. Uh, 
your uh, test errors and test results a lot clearer. Um, and it lets you be very specific about thinking through. You can enumerate, here's all the things that this method or this class should be doing. So there's a lot of benefits to having very small focused examples in your unit tests, um, not so much at your acceptance test level. But here, so, we're, so here we're wanting to make sure that the new blog post is returned to the view. Um, so uh, we're going to create that instance double of blog post. So this is, we don't need a real model instance. Um, we just need one that acts like one. So instance double uh, will create that for us. So it's now called blog post. We're going to um, stub out the method on the blog post class saying blog, the blog post can receive the create method. And when that happens, I don't care about the parameters. Uh, just return the blog post back to me. Um, it goes back into the controller. Now I hit the post there, and then now at the end, uh, like in our earlier unit tests, I'm checking the assigns. So I'm checking the instance variables that the controller sets. Um, and I'm checking to make sure it's equal to blog post, that it's the same instance that was sent back out of my blog post uh, model class. Um, so we can check this unit test. This should reproduce the error that, that the acceptance test is catching. Um, it's not exactly the same error message, but it's the same behavior. Saying, I'm expecting a blog post to be there in the assigns, and I got nil. So that's the same thing that's happening at the acceptance test level. And so the, uh, the code to implement it is very simple. We just assign the results of that create call to the instance variable. So we had already specified the blog post.create needed to happen. Now we're also, we also specified, hey, it also needs to get saved to this instance variable. So we've now let the test drive us to that behavior. Um, and now in the blog post controller spec, uh, everything's passing. Um, and so that's great. So our, our unit test, our controller test is passing. Um, so let's jump back up. Uh, to the uh, acceptance test. We'll run that and that's green. Our acceptance test is finally green. Um, so after all that time and stuff that you could have written in two minutes, um, and yet we followed this discipline and learned a lot about uh, TDD, um, we have our acceptance test passing. And so it actually led us through all the features we need to build to get this working, other than validation, as Frank pointed out, and real features for a real system. But again, you'd, you'd love to have an acceptance test that would, that would uh, drive that situation, that would test and cover and regression test your system for that validation to make sure it's in there. Just to be safe, let's run the whole test suite all together to make sure it all passes, and it does. So just rspec command without any, anything specific reruns everything. Um, and so now we're good to go. So we've, our acceptance test has gone green. It was red for a very long time. It went to green, and so now we're good. And so now it's actually time. Now comes the one example of something I could think of to refactor. So just throw in a little bit, just so you don't forget that you should be doing that a lot more than I've been doing here. Um, so one of the things we do as we look at our production code and we look at our test code, when we look in here in the uh, blog post controller unit test at the create method, there's a lot of duplication between these two examples. That's one of the reasons that people oftentimes will just put a lot in examples or in test cases because it's like, well, I already set all that up. I don't want to do it again. And a bigger thing, you might have dozens and dozens of lines of objects set up uh, and, and you don't want to duplicate that again. But you know, our spec and most test frameworks have other ways to do that. So we can get the best of both worlds. We can get these focused examples that are enumerating different behaviors this method should have without having to duplicate the uh, uh, the po well, the po having the post in there is great because that's describing exactly what you're doing. But the details of the parameters sent into it, like we don't really need that. So um, in our spec, you can just pull that up into a let statement to define a post params variable, um, fill it in there, and then now both of the examples are so much shorter. One of them is, well, with the line wrapping, it's three lines. The other one's four lines. That's nice and focused. That's much easier to parse. And the details of what's in the post params doesn't feel like it's t needed to be right there to make these examples readable. Like to me, that seems more readable. And so that refactoring really helped us out. And uh, of course, because we have tests, we can rerun them, make sure they're still green, we haven't broken anything, and we're good to go. So that is a quick round of trivial uh, work on test-driven development. And so what I would just say to encourage you, maybe that strikes you as great. Maybe you're like, oh, oh that sure took a while to write a single, uh, a single behavior in the system. But what I would say, just to cast a little vision, imagine if testing the way you want to is second nature. Like, what, how do you want to test? Maybe you don't want to test like that. Maybe you want to test in kind of a different way. But um, what are you struggling with with it? I certainly am. Like I'm very new to this and getting used to it. But imagine if testing the way you want to was second nature. If it was just a flow, you just went to it, you always knew what the next thing to do was, and you were guided through it, um, and uh, you had the experience, and you had um, the answers to questions to not have to always be figuring out, mock or stub, uh, should I step down a level or should I not step down a level? I really feel like TDD can help you get there, whether or not you end up embracing all of it. Um, having a great starting point like that, uh, I think can be very helpful. So that was a lot of info, but uh, what questions do you guys have about details of that, about TDD in general or testing in general? What questions do you guys have? Yeah. yeah so I have a question. This is actually to the room. Um, the plug in the beginning. I, I read the, 
DHH is blog post, like DVD is dead. So, how, how many people think that DVD is dead? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and if you think it's mostly dead or kind of dead, that's a valid opinion too. Or even dying. Dying, yeah. Mm-hmm. It does to me. Yeah, so how does that affect your, how would that affect your example? Yeah. I would have thought through it and come up with an example that was closer to what I actually do, probably at that point. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I was thinking about that beforehand and forgot to mention that there. But I think for a lot of the same reasons that a lot of folks I interact with don't do controller tests, uh, Rails had de has decided to remove the controller test support. Um, I was trying to figure that out because I was like, you know, I like the idea of being able to go to the extreme of kind of like being kind of academic about it and like, hey, anytime I've got a class, let me have a unit test or kind of a test that's specifically focused on that class. And so I was like, why is everybody that I look up to and respect and I'm learning from doing only acceptance tests and feature tests, not controller tests? Um, and I think the reason the click to me is when I think about the logic that I would generally have in a controller, um, it generally is like one or two, maybe hopefully just one if statement that maybe it's performing some operation and maybe it's either redirecting or re-rendering a, a page. And um, so I want to make sure that those cases are covered, but those are the kind of things that I would pretty much always have covered in an acceptance test. And so for me, um, it's the controller level, if you're doing controllers in a thin way, which I really like to do and I feel like is often encouraged, um, they're so close to the level of what the user is interacting, like it, they're kind of managing that user interaction that I feel like, without having done a ton of it myself to try, like I feel like probably your acceptance tests are really going to very, not just, your acceptance tests should thoroughly cover everything in this approach to TDD, but they're very directly covering what's in the controller. And so there should be a lot of duplication between those two. Um, I would say, uh, as far as how I changed my example in that setup, I got to get that ready because I'd love to be able to keep having this information once those controller tests are done. I think, um, oh, I meant to mention, uh, so like, the controller and the model are the two classes we have. For models in general, um, I, you know, from the Rails tutorial book, I was loving the idea of driving out the fields and the validations on my model. Um, but my team has generally discouraged that. And I think the reason is, like, you know, you don't, like, it's pretty trivial. Like, it's using the features of the framework. And so for a simple model like this, like, you wouldn't really need a unit test in the recommendations that I've gotten. And so basically, um, in order to get to something where you'd have something to unit test in that approach, like, you need to have some other kind of class, something that's not Rails specific, like, a query class, but I think Patrick might have a better idea for what to put in there. Well, I was thinking this all the whole time, and I think a lot of what you're doing is testing a framework, like like you're saying. Like this is, it, I think that's what controller tests are. When you have skinny controllers, you're testing the framework. When you're testing controllers, and um, this is kind of like testing your edge record. Like edge record is probably going to work, or else we're all going to know it's not working. <laughs> so um, unless someone's monkey patched it, <laughs> right? So yeah, maybe someone should test that, right? Yeah. But um, but. I think a good a good testing. I mean, if you're thinking asking for suggestions, uh, like third party integrations can be interesting. Mm. You're definitely writing a lot of your own logic that way, and you're trying to get into like integration testing as well as testing and a lot of unit testing. Mm. And it gives you all the different ways to talk about things. Cool. And you're also kind of like you're not like a cookie cutter solution most of the time. Like gotcha. there's lots of different ways to do something like that, depending on how big of uh, payloads you're messing with. And you're trying to like parse through like these things or not. Or, That's great. So, Another thought. Oh, let me repeat that real quick for the video. Uh, Patrick was recommending that uh, third-party integrate. This is going to be a super short summary. Third-party integrations may be a great place to uh, te to try out test-driven development, just because unlike a trivial model, there are a lot of questions to answer and design to be done, and so you'd have a more robust unit test that would happen there. Go ahead. Yeah. So along a similar line, um, you, you talked about like when you test when you unit test your, your models, for instance, um, and you had said like when when the logic gets hairy, I guess is my yeah. Um, so I, I like to think a little differently on that. I like okay. to think of my models as an API. Mm -hmm. So like I've got a contract. Every model that I put out there in my application is a contract that I have with whoever might consume it at some mm -hmm. point, right? And so I want to be able to say, I want my test to be able to say, here's how you can you can use this model, um, and for it to sort of enumerate the different ways that uh, that it can be used. And they might not all be exercised actually by my app. Um, so I, I might. Uh, I, I might write a method that 
it isn't exactly it isn't actually used by my app, but I anticipate it being used in the future, being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of for completeness, right? And so I'll, I'll write that as well. So if you think about it sort of as an API, then um, I, I think it makes it makes sense to be able to test them via unit tests because you're not testing. It. So in an acceptance test, you have just too many branches to be able to test all that stuff at once. Right. But with a unit test, you can cover each one of those things individually, and it's a very clear thing about as an API um, helps me to to think of my interactions with my models. You know, very clean. Cool. Yeah, just. Actually, that brings up a point. The, uh, Patrick probably never does this. But, uh, probably never. Um, you have a, a, a method in your model that is only ever exercised through the console. It's almost like a secret admin fix up the data problem. <laughs> There's no UI component. It's like how much test coverage for this. So, mm. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, to repeat that uh, for the recording, so the idea was um, thinking about models as just like any other class, something that has an API, and so specking out this is how it can be used um, and how it's expected to be used, um, and then also thinking about the possibility of features that aren't necessarily driven through the acceptance test, but they're just added in there for completeness or for uh, using from the console, and so that could be a reason to drive out those features uh, in the model as well. Um, yeah, if I didn't say it, at least in a model, um, having if you have business logic methods in there that are doing a few different things, that would be great to test. Um, custom validations, um, if it's just a custom validation in an individual model, I like to test that as well. It's a great place where it's easy to have multiple cases you want to check for. So, other questions? Yeah. So, in Elixir land, mock is a four-letter word. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's let's open up the can of worms there for dependency <laughs> injection. It was interesting in uh, Ruby world. Yeah. Um, the question was, um, you know, in in the Elixir world, rather than using a lot of mocks, there's a lot of, in a sense, dependency injection to be able to provide a different kind of service that's available and used just for testing. Um, so a couple different things on that. Um, one, so like there are, it sounds like you're familiar with this already, but for everyone, like there are several different kinds of test doubles. Um, I talked about mocks, which kind of verify that a certain message was sent, and then stubs, uh, I, did, I don't think I mentioned directly, that just have predefined behavior and return values. Um, one of my coworkers is looking into the idea of fakes, which is basically something that actually functions uh, is just a very lightweight, simple implementation. So maybe an in-memory hash store of objects rather than a database. Um, spying is another uh, alternative that's very similar to mocks that I'm very interested in and getting into. So um, as far as like the details of mocks and what they do to kind of define specific uh, methods, like there's other test doubles are an alternative. And there's a whole uh, other approach to DDD that's much more focused on state verification. Like what is the state of these objects or that database rather than what are the messages that are sent. Um, as far as dependency injection, it's interesting because I come from a, I'll go ahead and say it, I come from a Java and PHP background um, where Java dependence, where dependency injection was invented for good or ill, maybe not invented, but it's where it got big. Um, and then the PHP framework I use was big on dependency injection as well. Um, so I had good experiences with it and then was interested to see um, the negatives. Um, I know a lot of times um, you can do, uh, just using Ruby syntax, you can do very lightweight dependency injection where instead of just referring to a constant like blog post like I did, um, up in the constructor uh, for your class, you can have a, a parameter of like, you know, of blog post repository or just blog posts and the default value is the blog post constant. And so by default, you know, you'll have that variable uh, provided to your class that, it, that just is the controller and, so, uh, sorry, that is the, uh, uh, that is the class, the model class, and so that's going to work just like you always would if you had hard-coded the model class. But it's a parameter where in your tests you can pass in a, a stub version or a mocked version. Um, and so that, um, in a sense, has felt like the best of both worlds to me because right in the class you can see the real 
concrete implementation that's being used, which is one of the downsides of dependency injection when that's not there. But it's also super easy to put in a, a replacement as well. And then you don't have to do the mocking on the actual class the way I was doing there. Um, so um, I'm interested in getting more into Elixir to find out more about that. But that's a few things I've seen that are at least related, I hope, to your question. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. Um, if you want to learn more, again, learn TDD and Rails. It's my new super uh, trivial, uh, no graphic design website where I'm excited about these things and working on them. Um, the RSpec book is a classic book on this. It's actually more about way more than just the RSpec tool. It's about outside-in testing. Um, I think it's just gone. Uh, I just grabbed it off of Pragmatic Programmers just before it got um, not unpublished. I'm thinking of. Programming, unpublished, whatever, discontinued. Um, but it's still available on Amazon. So it's a bit older versions, but it is very concrete, very specific Rails examples. And the classic book on this approach to TDD called Mockist TDD is called Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. Um, I think it's just the only growing object-oriented software book. So if you just remember that part, you're good. Um, it's awesome. I recommend it. The examples are all in Java, so prepare your heart for that. Um, but uh, the first part is all the principles. And it's the one I go back to constantly. I'm constantly rereading it to learn more about this stuff. Um, and get in touch. Uh, thank you so much for letting me talk about this. I love testing and learning about it. So help me see things that I can do better and learn. And let's talk about it on Twitter, or you can find my email address on there. And uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at Variety.